In another video I talked about equal temperament, which is the tuning system used in virtually all Western music today, and it was developed in the late 1500s. Before that there were two other families of tuning system, one of which is called just intonation, and I'll talk about that in a separate video. The other one is called Pythagorean tuning, and that's the one I'm going to be dealing with here. So, to make a start on understanding what Pythagorean tuning is all about, I want to take you first of all over to the keyboard. So, here's our keyboard, and the first thing I should point out is that I can't play a Pythagorean scale on this keyboard because it's tuned to equal temperament. But what I can do is show you a few things that will lead us on the path to understanding how Pythagorean tuning works. So I want to focus on the scale of C major, which starts on C and goes up on the white notes. That's why I'm using C major. I don't have to use the, the black notes. I can just go straight up on the white notes. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C brings me back to C. So that's the familiar Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Di, Do. Okay, now that interval there the octave is what we call consonant. Consonant just means that it the notes fit together really well. The term that's used is stable. That's considered a stable interval because it doesn't want to go anywhere. You're already where you want to be. The other very stable and perfectly consonant interval is the fifth, which is the fifth note of the scale. So that would be so. So that one there. So that is called a perfect consonance, and the fifth is also called a perfect consonance. Now contrast that with the second, so that's the one and two notes played together. Kind of jarring, you know, they don't sit well together. You really want to go to another note like this, for example, which is the third. Also, the seventh interval, that's almost worse doesn't mean you can't use it in music, it's just that when you play those two in isolation it's very very dissonant. The term we use is dissonant. So we have consonant and dissonant. So you really want to go from that to that. That's the stable sound. So we've got two dissonances there, the second and the seventh. We've got two perfect consonances, the octave and the fifth. And we've also got a few others. We've got the third, and that sounds nice together, but that's called an imperfect consonance. We then have the fourth, which again, that's fine, but that's regarded as dissonant in some contexts and consonant in others. And then we've got the sixth, which also sounds fine, but that's regarded as an imperfect consonance as well. And then, of course, we get eventually back to the octave again. So some intervals are dissonant. Some are quite stable and are regarded as imperfect consonances. And some are very stable. In fact, the two that are very stable are the octave and the fifth. So what's so special about this interval, the fifth? Is it just some quirkiness of our brains that make it seem like a pleasant interval to hear? Or is there something more fundamental? Well, to understand that, I'm going to switch instruments now uh, to a guitar, because the beauty of the guitar is that we can actually see the things that are vibrating, and namely the strings. And when we look at the vibrating strings, we'll understand a little bit more about the, the physics of what's going on with these notes. So here's our guitar with its six strings in a state of tension and if I play one of the strings it vibrates between two points. One of the points is the bridge down here and the other one at the other end of the fretboard is the nut down here. So the string is vibrating between those two points. Now what I'm going to do is press the string down at its halfway point. Now the halfway point is here. 
and if I play it here this is what it sounds like there's the open string and there I'm pressing it down here this point here is exactly halfway along the string so it's the same distance down to the bridge in this direction as it is from the fret that's this piece of metal here to the nut down here so the string is being pressed at its halfway point to get the octave now remember the octave is one of the perfect consonances of the scale the other one is the fifth and I've marked on the notes of the major scale here second third fourth fifth sixth seventh and then up to the octave so let me just play that whole scale for you so here's the open note so do re mi fa so la ti do you'll see that I've marked on a couple of distances to the octave it's 32.5 centimeters in other words the distance from the nut to this fret here where the octave sounds is 32.5 centimeters the distance to the fifth is 21.5 centimeters now I'm going to use my trusty calculator to divide these two lengths so 32.5 divided by 21.5 equals 1.5 and a little bit now I measured these distances with a tape measure so I can't guarantee they're accurate to you know a millimeter they're probably a little bit out but that number there is very close to one and a half so here we've got a diagram that just summarizes what we've been seeing on the guitar that if you have a string and you stop it halfway along you'll produce an octave so that's the simplest ratio is is one to two giving you the octave which is one of the perfect consonances and if you stop the string two-thirds of the way along you produce a fifth which is the next simplest ratio two to three and is the other perfect consonants and also uh, the next one if we continue it if we stop the string uh, three quarters of the way along so we have a ratio of three to four we produce a a fourth now the Greeks of course didn't know all that we know about science and acoustics and frequencies and uh, the way sound waves work but they did have stringed instruments and they could experiment with strings and they made this discovery that if you divide the string up in these simple ratios you get the most consonant sounds. Pythagoras and his followers were obsessed by numbers and their relationship with the real world. So when they made this discovery that the fifth, that's the most consonant interval together with the octave, corresponded to a vibrating string stopped in this simple ratio of two to three, they decided to base their whole system of tuning on the fifth. And I want to quickly show you now how, how this works. So let's see if we can construct the scale of C major using Pythagorean tuning. We're going to start at C and we'll just choose a frequency and the frequency we'll use is, is middle C, which is 261.6 cycles per second or Hertz. So that's gonna be our starting point. Now on the Pythagorean scale, the first thing to do is to raise that by a fifth, which means multiplying by three over two. So that gets us to this point here and the note G on the Pythagorean scale. How do we produce our next note on the Pythagorean scale? Well, we start from here and we raise it by another fifth. That means multiplying by three over two again but now we've multiplied by 3 over 2 times 3 over 2. That's 9 over 4. And 9 over 4 is bigger than 2. So it pushes it into the next octave. And we don't want that. We want to be in this octave. So how do we get the corresponding note in this octave from the one we've ended up in, in the octave above? Well, we have to divide by 2 because all the frequencies in this octave are half the frequencies in this one. So overall, we've multiplied by 3 over 2, but then we've had to multiply by a half to get us back into this octave, the corresponding note in this octave. 
Well, if we've already multiplied by 3 over 2 at this point, and we then multiply by another 3 over 2, but then by a half, overall, from this point, we've multiplied by 3 over 4, which is the same as dropping by a fourth. So going up by a fifth and then dropping an octave is the same as dropping a fourth from your starting point. So now overall, we've gone 3 over 2 times 3 over 2 times a half. So overall, it's as if we started at C and multiplied by 9 over 8. Whichever way you want to think of it, we end up at this point here. Now starting at this point, we multiply by 3 over 2, which gets us to here. Now that's fine because we're still in the same octave. So that's the next note on our Pythagorean scale. To get the next one, we multiply by another 3 over 2, but now we have the same problem because we end up in this octave. So then we have to multiply by a half. So again, it's the same as this process here. Effectively starting here, we descend by a fourth to get to the next note on our scale. Then we multiply by 3 over 2 again to get the B on our Pythagorean scale. And finally, this is really the oddball one. Instead of going up and then back down, we start at the C and we actually descend by a fifth and then add an octave, which is the same as starting from here and adding a fourth or multiplying by four, four over three. So these are the ratios for producing all of the different notes on the Pythagorean scale starting from C. And you'll notice that the frequencies that we end up with, for example, the D on the Pythagorean scale, having started at middle C, is close to that on the equal temperament scale, but not quite the same. And in fact, you'll notice that all of the frequencies uh, on the Pythagorean scale are a little bit different than the equal temperament scale that we use today. Not tremendously different. We've got 493.9, 496.7. For uh, G, we've got 393.0, 392.4. So there's not a huge difference. And if these scales were played separately, you probably wouldn't really notice much of a difference. But certainly if these two notes were played together, then you would, you would detect a difference between them. OK, well, we've constructed the Pythagorean scale of C major based on repeated use of fifths. You might want to replay the last part of this video and maybe go through the calculations yourself to make sure you've understood them. What I haven't mentioned so far are the problems with Pythagorean tuning, such things as the Pythagorean comma and the dreaded wolf interval. I'll be talking about these in the next video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.